how to get rejected by a co-op board in New York City. Now this is not something you want, but by understanding how you might get rejected, it might increase your chances of not being rejected. So in this video, we will demystify the topic of co-op board rejections here in New York City. My name is Nick and I am with Houseit. We are the largest discounted commission platform for buyers and sellers here in New York City. So let's get started. So getting rejected by a co-op board. It's a nightmare scenario that you read about in the newspaper and which you might hear in conversations at a bar or at dinner with your friends. It is something that doesn't happen very often, despite what the headlines may suggest. But if and when it does, it can be totally devastating as far as a cost and lifestyle perspective is concerned. So in this video, we're going to talk about some of the most obvious ways you can get rejected by a co-op. The first way you can get rejected by a co-op is not conforming to the buyer financial requirements. And what do we mean by financial requirements for a co-op purchaser? Well, we're referring to the debt to income ratio and post-closing liquidity. Most co-ops in New York City are very focused on ensuring that the debt to income ratio for a purchaser is approximately 25 to 30%. So an easy way to get rejected is if your debt to income ratio is much higher than the guidelines. Now keep in mind, each building has its own guideline. Some buildings don't actually state what they are. And for the buildings that do have guidelines, they will also have their own unique formula for calculating DTI, debt to income ratio. For example, while one building may allow you to count your most recent high bonus for the debt to income ratio, a more conservative building might require you to utilize a two year average, or they might not allow you to include overtime at all. In some cases, a building might not allow passive income, such as dividend or other stock or passive investment related earnings. So as you can see, the debt to income ratio itself can be quite complex. Your buyer's agent should be able to help you navigate this. And again, it does vary by building. So to, to minimize the risk of a board rejection, you really wanna get into the weeds here and make sure that you've done the calculation correctly and you are, to the best of your knowledge, in line with the building's guidelines. Similarly, post-closing liquidity is a measurement of how much money you have left over in liquid assets after you've closed and after you've made your down payment and accounted for closing costs. Post-closing liquidity is defined by the number of months or years. You can continue to pay your apartment's carrying costs, the maintenance and the mortgage after you've closed using liquid assets only. The devil is in the details here because co-ops A, have different requirements for how much you need, and B, they have different methodologies to figure out what assets you should use when calculating this. So again, you do need to do your homework in conjunction with your buyer's agent just to make sure that you ostensibly do meet whatever guidelines the co-op may put forth. Another easy way to get rejected by a co-op is to have a purchasing structure that is simply not permitted by a building. So what do we mean by purchasing structure? Well, take for example, co-purchasing or purchasing with a guarantor. Each co-op will have its own set of policies restrictions on these types of purchasing arrangements. One building might permit guarantors, another might not permit co-purchasing. Other unique forms of purchasing include parents buying for children or children buying for parents. And again, all of these co-ops will have policies that can tell you whether or not something like this would be permitted. So even if a listing agent isn't concerned and you have an accepted offer, you don't want to sign that contract until you've confirmed unequivocally that whatever purchase structure you have in mind, assuming it's just not you or your partner just buying a home, is actually permitted by the co-op. On a related note, gifting is something that can also be somewhat more difficult than it may appear otherwise. In particular, each co-op has its own policy on A, whether or not gifting is permitted, but B, the size of the gift. Some buildings don't like large gifts because they liken it to a parent's buying for children scenario. So you're gonna to have to double check here to make sure that the size of your gift is okay and of course the fact that the building permits gifting in the first place. Another easy way to get rejected by a co-op is by not following the pet policy. Each co-op will have its own policy in terms of types of pets they allow, types of breeds they might not permit, and also possibly a weight restriction. 
We've heard stories, and these stories are true, of a buyer actually being rejected simply because their dog is a few pounds above the weight limit. And in some cases, the board members have actually weighed a dog at the interview. So again, these things are important to keep in mind, but it's also a very positive thing because everything we've talked about thus far is something you have complete control over. If you do your homework and follow the rules and ask the right questions, you shouldn't really expect to be rejected on the basis of any of the things we've just talked about. Another way to get rejected by a co-op board is by doing a really bad job at your interview. Now the co-op board interview is actually a very good thing to be invited to in the first place. And that's because the fact that you've been invited actually means that the co-op board has reviewed your application and they're generally speaking okay in principle with you being a part of the community. Another way to phrase being invited to a co-op interview is to actually consider yourself as having been conditionally approved for the purchase. Conditional of course on the outcome of your interview. So an interview for a co-op is very different from a job interview. In a job interview, you might be competing with 20 more people and there might only be one job available. So in that interview, you have to take risk. You have to be the one that the business wants to hire. A co-op interview is not like this. They know who you are and you're the only person who's currently lined up for that apartment. So the objective at a co-op interview is really just to come across as the same person in your application, and of course to follow certain guidelines which we talk about in another video. But in essence, at a co-op interview, you wanna make sure that you're forthright, transparent, concise with your answers, and that you don't ask obviously inappropriate questions, such as, when can I move in? Do you plan on renovating the lobby? How do I submit my renovation plan for my apartment? Or anything that can be construed essentially as you not understanding the fact that you could be rejected. So being presumptuous, at a co-op board interview or asking the wrong questions or giving off vibes like you think you already live there is a very easy way to be rejected by a co-op board here in New York City. Finally, one pro tip. This is something that is quite important, particularly in a low interest rate environment. Many co-ops do not permit adjustable rate mortgages. And for some co-ops that do allow them, they require your debt to income ratio to meet the building's guidelines using the highest possible interest rate under the terms of your ARM. Many listing agents are not aware that a co-op might have restrictions on this. So we have seen instances where a purchaser moves forward with an accepted offer, signs a contract, and they submit the board application with a commitment letter for an adjustable rate mortgage when the building will require that the debt to income ratio be calculated with a very, very high interest rate. Obviously, most buyers would not be able to meet a 25% debt to income ratio under the highest rate of an ARM, which in some cases can be six, seven, or 8%. So another easy way to be rejected by a co-op is to fail to figure out what policies they have about the type of loan product and to proceed uh, with an adjustable rate mortgage when it might not be permitted. Now, fortunately, in the case we mentioned, the co-op board was merciful and they came back and they gave the buyer the opportunity to resubmit the application with a commitment letter for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So that deal was able to move forward. And a silver lining there is that the interest rates actually fell during this process. So the buyer actually got a better deal when they relocked their interest rate. But interest rates could have gone in the other direction or more severely, the co-op might not have approved him in the first place. We hope you found this video helpful. If you are looking to buy a co-op in the city, visit our website, houseit.com, to learn about ways to save money as a buyer and reduce your buyer closing costs. And if you like this video, do us a favor, feel free to hit subscribe, like, and we'll see you on the next one.